the membership director here at the Community Church. And I'm really excited about talking with you today about an important reason why I'm here welcoming. Whoever you are, whomever you love, however you came to this beloved place, you are welcome here. These welcoming words are said at virtually every one of our services, but what do they mean? Why is radical hospitality important? How can we as individuals and as a congregation better embody this message and be our best at welcoming others and feeling welcome ourselves? This morning, I'm going to talk about what welcoming means, both literally and figuratively, reflect upon our traditions and words of wisdom as to why practicing radical hospitality is deeply important, and share some of what I've learned about how to become more truly welcoming. Finally, we'll look ahead toward our future together as a growing community. First, what do these words not mean? When Reverend Tom and I were discussing this sermon, he said, one of the things to be very careful about is the idea that the welcome equals being insulated from anything that makes one feel uncomfortable. That is not what welcoming means. Church, especially UU Church, needs to expose people to ideas and challenge people in ways that make them uncomfortable. For some people, that is political ideas, for others, it is theological ideas, and for still others, it's expectations of how to be in community. So what do they mean? The welcoming words mean whoever you are. It means some perhaps obvious things like not just those who are the same race or the same age or who have the same level of education or income or those who come from a similar religious background. I've learned that it also means some less obvious things, like not just those who worship as we're accustomed to, not just those who know not to clap. <laughs> not just those who agree with our choice of political candidate or every aspect of our political agenda, no matter how obviously right we think we are. Not just those who smell nice, speak English well, and know how to stand the appropriate distance away from us when we're talking to them, or who know when to stop complaining, everyone. The welcoming words also mean whomever you love. And as most of us understand this, that means all sexualities are welcome, as in those who are straight, gay, or bisexual, and I dare say we're pretty good at this. But it also means pansexual, asexual sexualities we haven't even heard of yet. But I have learned that whomever you love also means more than sexuality. There are those among us who love others who don't agree with the predominant political bent of this church, or love those who are fighting mental illness, addiction, or criminal charges, and they too are welcome. The welcoming words mean however you came to this beloved place. And this seems a simple line. Not just those who know about you, you, not just those who like coffee, but those who are new and dubious, as well as those who are new and enthusiastic. Those who are new and seeking solace, as well as those who are seeking a vibrant faith community. And I've learned that it also means even those who have left for whatever reason and have returned for any number of reasons. I invite you to reflect with me on how it looks to be truly welcoming to everyone, especially the strangers and longtime members who make us uncomfortable. Are we practicing what we preach? So what is radical hospitality and why is it important? According to the dictionary, some words that define radical are thorough, total, rigorous, and progressive. And of course, hospitality is defined as the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or strangers. So what does it look like to receive someone, a stranger, with a presence that is not just polite, but thoroughly, rigorously friendly and generous? According to the Reverend Dr. Marilyn Sewell, 
Hospitality is a word with spiritual history. Monasteries grew up around the fifth century. Strangers in need could come there for care. The first primitive hospitals began there. Hospital, hospice, hospitable, hospitality, all from the same root word meaning generous, caring, and sustaining. The most famous of these monasteries was that of St. Benedict. Benedict created a book of rules to live by called the Rule of Benedict, which is used still today by many monasteries and I might add other faiths as well. The foundation of the rule is listening. Benedict wrote, listen with the ear of your heart. And this radical hospitality is important because it's part of our mission, literally. This church's vision statement says, quote, we are a welcoming, multi-generational, and multicultural congregation. We initiate programs that grow our skills to increase and sustain the diversity of our church community. We embody an active and visible culture of intentional, radical hospitality that stands on the side of love and effectively welcomes and integrates new members. Radical hospitality is also important because all of our seven principles are a commitment, a promise to not only promote, I mean rather not only affirm, but also promote. It's not enough to simply think these things or agree with them. The inclusion of the word promotion means I must also do them. Welcoming is one way of putting these principles into action. I can see the emphasis of being welcoming in all seven principles, but rather than read them all to you, which would be boring, here are some of my favorite examples. The first principle, we promise to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. I can live this principle by welcoming all people equally. The second principle, we promise to affirm and promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. I can live this principle by rigorous listening with my heart in relations as simple as those we experience here each week or more complex dynamics such as contentious and potentially divisive issues within our church. Radical hospitality is also an important part of our particular history and our future. First, a little history. As many of you know, the community church has a history of welcoming when welcoming could mean ostracism or violence. Our founding minister, Charles M. Jones, worked unwavering, unwaveringly for racial equality, participating in possibly the first racially integrated public meeting in Chapel Hill ever and facilitating integrated meetings within the church. This was radical. It was so radical that the U.S. War Department issued a confidential memo calling for Preacher Jones's dismissal. He worked with Baird Rustin and other freedom writers, and as a result, he got death threats. He was threatened with physical violence. People threatened to burn his house down with his wife and children in it. And the police repeatedly refused to help. Reverend Jones was the epitome of radical hospitality. He risked his life for it. I think I can chat with someone new at coffee hour. <laughs> Inclusion was radical then and it's radical today when so many claiming deeply held beliefs would like to divide the world. Looking to the future, we have to become welcoming to be sustainable. It's a matter of long-term survival. According to the UUA's aggregate data from UUA congregations, of which we are one, Membership has declined by over 2% over the last fiscal year, nationwide. I am delighted to say that our congregation has defied this trend by a net increase of membership of around 10% during the same time period. <laughs> well, why is this? I believe that not only do those who have recently chosen to join us like the preaching and the programs, but they feel welcome thoroughly, rigorously welcomed. I would like for as many folks as possible to know that they too are welcome. So how do we become our most welcoming? Well, 
You may have noticed some of the many efforts that Reverend Tom, ECO, membership team, and I have made to make, help new folks and longtime attendees feel welcome and to get connected. We'd love to have your help, help in uh, helping others feel welcomed and help in learning how we can help you feel welcome. The opportunities to lose someone by helping them feel unwelcome are innumerable. From not enough parking available, to not being acknowledged as they enter a service, to not enough hymnals, to no one sitting next to them during service, to no one speaking to them at coffee hour. And when people don't feel welcome, they're much less likely to return. And then we'll never know what unique, unique gifts they might have brought. However, there is hope. There are some simple steps we can take together, starting today, right now. They're all easily achieved by following what Reverend Tom calls the four Ps, presence, participation, pledging, and passing it on. The first P, presence. Your presence is requested. Although we do not take attendance, we'd love to see you. We can't be welcoming if we're not here. When we are together, we can wear our name badges. It may seem inconsequential, but wearing our name badges helps create a welcoming atmosphere. It's not for you, you know your name, it's for others. It's a small service for others, but it can make a big impact. If only new folks wear name badges, it makes them other. That's not very welcoming. Not only does identifying ourselves in kind negate the otherness of new members, it's to help strengthen our community by helping those of us who have been around a while remember one another's names. That makes us more likely to talk to each other. That helps us connect with one another. If you know me, you may know that I'm pretty good with names, but not all of us are. We can sit with someone new during service. We can talk with someone new or old. I've heard the rule of three. Talk with someone whom you don't know for just three minutes after service. Notice I didn't say talk to someone. That's because this practice is not just for the extroverts among us. If we want to be welcoming, listening, listening with the ear of our hearts can be more welcoming than talking, especially for those seeking solace and comfort in a time of crisis. According to Reverend Dr. Teresa Cooley, we, quote, we need to risk being intrusive. She says, I have yet to meet a UU congregation that is too intrusive. It just doesn't happen. People say, we don't want to invite them too much because that would be too intrusive. But she's not talking about assaulting people when they come in the door. What people want is to be listened to. Asking questions is what leads to connections. Also, this practice isn't just for connecting with people who are new to our community. It's also for creating and maintaining community within our church, including those who have been here a long time. This, in turn, gives us more to offer those who are new. Last fall, the outreach team, uh, the membership team, pardon me, made outreach calls to every member and associate within our church. When asked about their feelings of connectedness, I'm happy to say that uh, the most common response was, all good. But one of the second most common responses was that nobody speaks to them at coffee hour. One particularly stubborn person I know kept coming, week after week, for over two years, without someone speaking to them first at coffee hour. They knew some people with whom they could speak, but when those folks weren't there or were occupied, crickets. This person approached people, but had they not had the gumption to extend themselves, what would have happened? They probably would have left quietly without our knowing why. Instead, they're now an active part of our church community, and I think we are the better for it. How many people, each with their unique gifts, have we missed because we didn't extend ourselves for fear of being intrusive? The second P, participation. Everyone knows the old adage, you get out of something what you put into it. So what can we put into it? Your unique gifts. Each of us has something unique to offer to the community. 
It was once said to me, if you're looking for community, you aren't going to get it by coming only Sunday mornings. There's so much going on in this church during every, any given week, from acting in one of our stage productions to Zen Buddhist studies. As we begin the next church year, I invite you to contemplate what would work for you. Please know that you are welcome to participate in whichever groups call to you. If you don't find something that feeds your soul, create it and welcome others to join you. That's how all these things started, after all, and you probably aren't the only one who would find nourishment from your efforts. The third P, pledging. First, I want to thank all those who pledged this fiscal year. You are those who make it possible for us to welcome anybody at all. Without the support of those who feel welcome here, we couldn't offer much to those who wish to join us. You are those who keep the lights on, the mics working, the half and half flowing, and all the other groups, activities, and committees functioning so that we all can all join together in community. And if you haven't yet pledged, it's not too late. There are always needs in a dynamic, multi-generational community. Scholarships for kids to go to chalice camp, assistance for a family who's having trouble keeping the AC on because of job loss, waiving pledges for an elderly person on a fixed income. Your help makes this church a welcoming place for people at all different ages, stages, and incomes. The fourth P, passing it on. At the Exploring Membership classes, Reverend Tom cites a statistic, and I looked it up, it's real. A Unitarian Universalist invites someone to church every 27 years. <laughs> Why is this? I know that ours is a faith of self-determination and self-governance and that people should not and cannot be coerced into being part of our church. But I have learned that being welcoming, as I was welcomed into this church, can make a difference. I mentioned to some friends that I was looking for a community of people with shared values. I wanted what I saw other people getting from church without the dogma. I had some negative church experiences in the past, having tried many, but these friends People whom I respect said that they loved their church. Then something strange happened. They invited me, anti-church, anti-organized religion me, to join them. It took over two years of them telling me that my family was welcome before I finally visited. Still, I wasn't sure that I was welcome because that person I mentioned who came to coffee hour for over, a, well, two years without someone approaching them, that was me. However, Marion made my kids feel welcome, so we tried it, and we kept trying it. We kept showing up, being present, and I quickly learned that I was welcome to volunteer. <laughs> Folks needed help with middle school youth group, so I pitched in, I participated. I shared my ideas on how to welcome others to join us, and now we have an event that brings on average around 60 young people and their families into community every month throughout the church year. I give of my time, my energy, and my resources so that others will feel welcome, but so will I. I've also begun, rather, to pass it on. At first, my queasiness about the word church and all its negative connotations made me follow up any mention of our church with, but it's not like that, and other qualifiers. With some practice, it's become easy and natural. Since we're so involved with this church, I often talk about what's going on here with others, and they'll ask about church, and I let them know that they're welcome, and I invite them to a service or a function. I also extend our welcome when someone expresses that desire for community based on shared values, or when someone shares an interest in one of the myriad of activities within our community. It is the simple act of welcoming that brought me here. Welcoming is part of our faith's foundation. Welcoming is important. And welcoming works. 
Thank you very much and welcome.